Welcome back to the Foundries Church YouTube channel. We're excited that you chose to connect. If you want to connect throughout the week, please like us on Facebook or subscribe to this channel. With that being said, let's dive into the current series called Short and Sweet. Well, hey friends, welcome. As we uh, dive in tonight, um, it's, an, it's, an exciting, it's an exciting journey we're about to go on in the Word of God. Um, and, and I'm excited for us because last week we talked about testing, uh, testing those who influence us. Today, we're going to let the Word of God do some work in our lives like the surgeon's scalpel. And I'm excited about it, so I'm going to ask you to join me in prayer real quick, and then we are going to dive into the teaching. Heavenly Father, uh, bless your word as it is read among your church. May it be a living, active word. May it do the work that only your word can do. May it work deep into our hearts, call us to a life transformed by grace. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So short and sweet, part two. As we jump in today, you can tell there's... um, some strange look. I don't know if, if you weren't part of us last week, we, we unpacked the princess and the pea, and we talked a little bit of that story and the beginning of the apostle John's first letter to the churches, and we talked about some of the tests we have for those who are influencers. Well, tonight we have Sword in the Stone, which this is an awesome sword, and I would like to try it one day. But, um, but this sword, uh, what we're going to do is we want to look at the sword and the stone and understand, well, maybe a little bit of how this story relates to what John's saying. Anybody here ever see the sword and the stone? Help me out here. Yeah, just in case you wonder, um, the wolf in that movie, in the sword and the stone, the Disney remake, that's the wolf that inspired Earl. Uh, in my children's childhood story. So whenever we watch that, we, we laugh till we weep because Earl's in it, and it's an awesome thing. But let me give you a brief background on it. So the story is the story of a knight named Kay. And Kay, is, um, he's training to, to, to become a knight, right? He's, he's going to be a, a nobleman in the English uh, kingdom, but the king kingdom has been vacant for a number of years of a monarch because the king had died. The good king had passed away, and when the king passed away, there was no heir to appoint into the, to the monarch position to be king or queen. So a, a stone appears with a sword in it, and it said, whoever is going to be king, is going to be the noble, the the knight or the person who can pull the sword out of the stone, the person who does that, well, they'll be king. All the strongest and bravest knights of the realm go up to the stone, they put their foot on it, grab the sword, and pull with all their might, but again and again, the, the sword just doesn't budge. The sword doesn't budge. Eventually, moss grows up around the stone. It's forgotten, and the kingdom has no monarch, and it kind of falls into disrepair. And that's where we find Kay as a middle teenager, probably 18 years old. He is a um, thick, forearmed, tough guy, and he is out hunting, bow hunting one day, and he's about to shoot this deer in the pasture when his squeaky-voiced 11 to 12-year-old little brother named Wart, lovingly named, by the way, he goes, hey, Kay, look at the deer, and he hits him, and Kay shoots. The arrow goes way over and into the forest, and Wart says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'll go get your arrow, and off into the forest he goes, where he encounters the magician Merlin. Goes into this story, Merlin kind of trains the boy. Eventually, Kay goes to London for a jousting tournament. He wants to win the tournament and, and win the honor of the crowd. He's there. They get ready for Kay's match, and what did young Wart, his squire, forget? His sword. He forgot Kay's sword. And they were like, why I oughta, you know, and he takes off, I'll get it, I'll get it. And he runs off into the village to find the inn where they had been staying. And on their way, he passes a much mossed and vined over stone with a sword in it. Grabbing the sword, young Wart gives a tug. A ray of light from heaven shines down. And the sword slides out of the stone. And this lanky armed 80 pound kid becomes king, becomes king. 
It's an unlikely story. But he looked and thought, well, it's worth it. Did you ever have a did you ever moment? Did, can I really do it? A moment where you're sitting there with your friends and they're like, do it. And you're like, I don't know if I can make it. And they're like, sure you can. And you're like, oh, I don't know if I could. Did you ever have that moment in your life where you wanted to maybe pull the proverbial sword in the stone out, do the thing no one else could do? I mean, there's a wonderful picture of me at um, the magical place Disney World. And then the next picture is me proving yet again that I'm not royalty. And it's a little disappointing, but we all know this, that we have stories in our lives where we wonder, could I do it? Tonight we're going to talk about doubts that linger, about questions we have, the do you think I really am moments, really am capable or really am, well, maybe in some of our cases. Do you ever have questions that are like, I wonder if I'm saved? Anybody ever wonder that in your life, especially after some Nimrod cuts you off? By the way, Nimrod's a biblical name. Look it up, Deuteronomy, Right? You wonder if you're saved. Do you ever have moments in your life where you wonder, do do I really love God or am I just happy that he, I've got some divine bending machine that I cash my chips in with once in a while? Do you ever wonder, does God's spirit really live in me? Does God's spirit really live in me? Am I really saved? And you don't know how to test these things and see if it's true. I grew up in a tradition where there were people in it who said, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. Well, for me, a charismatic, I am a Pentecostal, I'm a charismatic person, but I've never been given a prayer language. I've never spoken in tongues. And I grew up in a tradition where many people said, if you don't speak in in tongues, you're not saved. I mean, bummer, right? That's fairly disappointing for me. Maybe some of you grew up in a tradition where if you went through hardship, it meant God doesn't love you because he gave you more than you could bear. And we ask these questions, am I saved? Does God's spirit really live within me? Do I really love God? And here's the thing, the enemy of our soul, Satan loves to ask these questions, get us pondering questions about our assurance of salvation, our belief in God's character and his promises, and what he loves to do is he loves to sabotage us in our walk and purpose with him. But if we face his challenge with Scripture, which is the sword of the Spirit, if we face his challenges with Scripture, we are deeply, profoundly encouraged. And don't ever take for granted how much encouragement means. Because I'll tell you this, if you ever run like a long race, like run the riverbank one year. Run the 25K and see how much it, it just blesses your soul to have people cheering for you as you run. You're like, oh, thank you. I'm a little out of shape, but I'm giving it my all, right? It feels so good to be encouraged. Tonight, we're going to cling to the scripture, Hebrews 4, verses 12. For the, word of the Lord is, for the word of the Lord is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's sharp enough to divide soul from spirit and bone from marrow. It is judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. So let's take this tonight and let's put a few swords into our lives to do what John intended when he wrote this book, to put to test the questions we have and to find out, let the Spirit of God, let the Word of God divide our doubts and the truth and then we'll cling to the truth. Sword number one. 1 John 4, 13 through 15. It says this. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent his Son to be Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. So let's just ask a question. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, 100% God, 100% man, his life, his death, and his resurrection? 
Just remember the truths we talked about last week when John challenged us to test our influencers when he said, know who Jesus is, know what the deal with sin is, know what it is to forgive, and know what it is to live a life of love. Let the sword of the Spirit, let Scripture divide you and see if you truly do have Jesus Christ living within you. Do you believe those things? Do you believe in who Jesus is? Do you know them to be true? doesn't mean you don't wrestle with it, but it does mean, do you know them? There's times where I'm driving on a freeway when we're on a road trip, and I, you, know, you get the thought when you're about five miles out of Atlanta, did I somehow get on the wrong freeway because there's so many interchanges? And what do you start doing? You start looking for signs that you're on the right freeway, that you're on the right freeway. I wouldn't mind if I took a wrong turn and ended up in like Augusta at the golf course, but most likely that's not going to happen. So I want to make sure I'm on the right path. In the same way we should do that with the Word of God. Make sure we're on the right path. But let me ask you this. You are going to endure testing in your faith, right? Has anybody else ever had that where someone tests your faith? Well, if you believe in Jesus, why does all that bad stuff happen in the world? Because of people like you, Terry, right? That's what we want to say back, but we probably shouldn't. But the reality is we look at it and we have tests in our faith. Let me ask you this. How do you act when people test your faith? and push on your faith? Are you quick to follow them and change your mind and alter your course? Or are you quick to say, wait a minute, let me go back to scripture and remember what I believe. Doesn't mean you have to explain it all or know it all. I get stumped all the time. But I go back to the roots of my faith in scripture. When we face those questions, are you quickly led away? And if you are, you need to go back and cling to the truth of who Jesus Christ is, the work he did over sin, the calling in your life to receive and extend forgiveness and to live in the spirit of love. Sword, number two, 1 John 4, 16 to 18. It says this, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence On the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Have you ever wondered where that scripture was? We've all heard it before, but that's it. It's in 1 John. Perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment, and the one who fears is not made perfect in love. Anybody here ever get busted when you were little and your mom said, When your dad gets home, you're like, Oh no, anything but that. Anybody? Literally, it was, okay, good, a few of us. Because I, it was like the time I was like, God, please don't send my dad home ever, right? I just didn't want the man to come home because I knew I was in trouble and I was afraid. But here's the reality. In Jesus Christ, the fear we have of God's wrath and judgment should be abated and pushed away. We should not live in fear, but in the perfect knowledge of Christ's love. That his love for us has redeemed us. That his love for us has made us purposeful. So here's the reality. If you're in Christ and you're living in fear, I want to invite you to turn your fears towards Christ and let him remind you, you don't sit under the wrath of God. God's not sitting like your dad in traffic when you had done wrong and mom called him and he was on his way home. That's not how it works. That's not what's going on here. That's not what's going on. You are forgiven. You are forgiven completely. It is a gift from Jesus Christ. The real question is this. Have you received it? Have you received the gift of free eternal life in Christ Jesus? Most of us are like, you know, I know this to be true. Most of us do this. Like you get a gift. Someone's like, yeah, you know, I got this for you. And you're like, Oh, no, you didn't have to. Anybody do that? Yeah, you do. I've given some of you gifts. And you're like, no, 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 no. And like you literally, you push away. And you're like, oh, no, no, no. And if you take it, you put it in the passenger seat like it has leprosy and drive straight to Starbucks and buy them a $15 gift card and a small thing to say thank you for the gift you got because there has to be an exchange. 
thank you for thanking me because this is somehow healthy, right? (laughs) Super weird of us, but we do it. Here's the thing. That's not how it works with Jesus. It's not how it works. You can't be like, thank you for saving my soul. I'll now go to Morocco just to make you happy. I'll serve you forever. We make deals with God he doesn't want to make, and he's no part of. He has a calling on your life, a purpose for your life, but you just received the gift of salvation. The only way we can respond to the free gift of salvation is living in devotion to him. But it's not by giving of yourself. It's by submitting yourself to his will and his purposes. Here's the best news. Some of the best news you'll ever hear. You can do nothing to make God love you more. And you can do nothing that will make God love you, love you less. Don't you ever worry? Man, I really got God mad today. The man upstairs, by the way, never call him that. I super hate that name for God. Boy, he's mad at me. No, he's not. The love of God is unchanging. It doesn't depend on your behavior. It, take it back to Scripture. You can look at Scripture and recognize the love of God was extended to you while you were a sinner. You can make him love you no more or no less. You can simply rest in the fact that the love of God is yours to receive. You were sinful. You were destined for hell. Christ paid for you, your sin and your brokenness in one lump sum. It has been reconciled. There's nothing more you can do. Stop living under the fear of judgment and receive the free gift of the peace of Christ which passes understanding because you and I could never understand such a gift. We could never understand such peace because we are totally sinful apart from Christ. Sin isn't what you do, it's who you are. Sin isn't something I stumble into, it's something I am by nature. And the only thing that can change the nature of Eric Folkers and everyone else listening to this is the very person of Jesus Christ and his spirit filling us. But now you're totally forgiven. You're completely forgiven. But here's the thing. Satan doesn't just go, oh, man, I lost. Okay, well, lost that one. No. No, no, he doesn't fish fair. He's the guy who drops a stick of dynamite in and blows the whole thing up and they all float up. He'll do anything to take as many with him into hell and damnation. So here's the thing we know. He's a liar. He's a liar. And he will try to convince you. That's why we've got to go back to Scripture and let the sword cut and divide the lies from the truth. And here's what we know to be true. Satan will speak condemnation over you. The Spirit of God will only speak conviction about your sin, and he will speak conviction, and it's painful, and it stings, but it's conviction. This is what conviction sounds like. Eric, you shouldn't have yelled at your daughter. Hi, Bella. Um, Sorry about that. You were just, you were in my view. Um, Eric, you shouldn't have yelled at your daughter. That was ungracious. It was wrong. Go make it right, and sometime as a parent, I'm like, I don't want to say I'm sorry. I'm the dad. I don't have to be sorry. I feed her, right? And the spirit says, Eric, crazy man that you are, go say you're sorry. I'm fine. But I don't want to mean it. Eric, go make the relationship right. You know what the condemnation, the voice of the evil one says? You are the worst father on earth. You are worthless. You're a horrible man. You know which one's easier to listen to? Have you ever been like driving and that condemnation hits you? You'll never stop in that pattern of saying, oh, you're right. You're, you're, you're worthless. You're stupid. You're ugly. You've got nothing to offer. Why are you still here? You know what? The world's better without you. That is the voice of Satan. It's condemnation that calls into question the word of God that says you were worth the death of Christ. You were worth the death of Christ and you're worth the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, make that relationship right. Make that relationship right. Settle accounts. Forgive. Restore that relationship. The Spirit prompts us to repent from our sin and turn towards godly living. 
And the, the one who loves to condemn us, Satan, speaks curses over our lives that sound like truth, but they're a lie from the pit of hell. Learn to know the difference between one who condemns you and the one who calls you back into relationship. The Spirit of God always calls you back into relationship by an active participation of making right what is wrong. Sword number three, uh, 1 John 4, 4, 19 to 21. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. For, whatever, for whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have not seen cannot love God whom they have seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother or sister. I love that. John's so witty. That it, just think of it. How can we as Christians be like, ugh, I hate Phil, which I don't, but I hate Phil. Phil, Phil, you know, he fills me with despair. That's perfect. <laughs> Sorry, that was mean to Phil, but you don't fill me with despair. But, you know, like, just think of it, like, if we're role playing here, I hate Phil. Ugh! But I love you, Jesus, Savior of my soul. Does that even make sense? How can you hate what Jesus died to save? How can you despise in your heart and soul that which Christ died on the cross to redeem? How can you hate what is right in front of you but love what you've never seen? That's madness, and John will have none of it in the church. The apostle John says to you and to I, let the word of God speak. We are called to love one another. Do you love your brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you love them in living, active ways? Don't lie to yourself. Don't lie to yourself, don't lie to me, don't lie to the world around you. Think over this last week. Is there any hatred brewing in you? Have you hated someone in your heart? Or do you work to forgive with that same amazing spirit with which God forgave you? Let me just be very honest. I was in a meeting this week, and I had that moment where God shines a light Inside your heart, in a dark, musty corner you forgot existed, I had a moment like that sitting in a meeting, and I knew I had somebody I had to forgive, and I'm working on it, because when I started composing the email, it was like, I wanted you to know I forgive you, because you're, and it was growing, it was growing by the end, I'm like, you're a horrible person, and that's an exclamation point, and that little emoji that's brown and swirls, and uh, I, uh, it was so quick, and I was like, I'm going to delete all of that and start with, I need to say I'm sorry it took so long for me to get here. I forgive you because you're, oh, wait, it is hard. I'm working on it. I'm working through it. So I know you are too. I know you are too, but the reality is we are called to forgive. Corey Ten Boom, one of the great saints of the last century, was interned at Ravensbrook during World War II for hiding and protecting Jews in the Netherlands. Her sister Betsy and her dad were also interned, Betsy with, um, with Corey, in Ravensbrook. Betsy died there. Corey survived. She was speaking at a church one night when a red-headed guard from Raven, Ravensbrook, which who, one of her most cruel tormentors, came walking up towards her. And he comes up and he says, I've become a Christian. I'm totally forgiven. Now, imagine what it's like for Corey, whose sister's body was stacked up like cordwood and mistreated and maligned and ruined and stolen from her life. And Corey is standing in front of this person who's like, I'm a Christian now. It's all good. I'm forgiven. And on top of that, I asked God to give me the opportunity to ask one of the people I oppressed and tortured and ruined to forgive me. Oh, how would you respond? And she said, I cannot forgive you. I cannot forgive you. But thank you, Jesus that your spirit living within me can love him. And so she looked at him and said, I do forgive you. 
I do forgive you. And she restored unto him a soul that he had surrendered in Ravensbrook as a Nazi executioner. And she gave back to him something she would never have restored to her, the dignity of her life. She gave him living dignity and and freedom when she could have said, there's no way I would forgive you. How dare you ask me for that? You murdered my father, my sister, my friends. You turned Europe into an ash heap. No, I don't forgive you. You deserve to burn in hell. But what'd she say? I can't forgive you. But thank you, Jesus, that you can forgive him through me. And she leaned back into the Spirit of God. And she let something flow out of her that is so antithetical to our human nature. But is completely in line with the nature of God. It was love beyond what is humanly possible. If she can forgive that, surely my email should be quite short this week when I forgive someone who has done a micro fraction of what was done to her. And the same from your life and to those who've hurt you. Sword number four. Uh, 1 John 5, 2 to 5. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this love for God to keep his commands and his commands are not burdensome. Don't you love when you hear someone talk like the person they love? Remember the words of Jesus? Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens. And I will give you rest. Come to me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And John's saying to us right here, in fact, this love for God, the keeping of God's commands, his commands, they're not burdensome. It's not like putting on, you know, one of those giant backpacks and slogging up Mount Everest. It's actually quite light to do what God calls us to do. We're equipped and purposed for him. So the question is, do we obey God? Do we obey God? And if we do, then we should know what his commands are. His commands haven't changed. When I was first at Vreesland Reformed Church as their youth pastor, back circa 2002, Pastor Mike would stand up in front of the church every Sunday, and when he dismissed church, he would say this, Vreesland Church, what does the Lord require of you this week? There's a few of us who um, have come from Vreesland and, and are part of this church, and we know the answer if we are there. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Man, if my neighbor's Corey Tin Boom, it's fine. But I live next door to Cousin Eddie, right? Who knows Cousin Eddie from the vacation series? Remember the picture of him in his ear flap snow hat, cigar hanging out? draining his RV sewage tank into the public sewer, like the the storm sewer, in a bathrobe and rubber boots. Morning! And don't you feel like that's who your neighbor is emotionally? Not my physical neighbors. They're lovely people. But I'm talking about more of an emotional thing. So please, Paul and Kathy, I hope you're not watching your lovely people. But um, but the reality is, like, don't you feel like if Corey Tin Boom was my neighbor, who I had to love, it'd be so much easier to love that sawed-off little Dutch woman who helped the Jews and forgave Nazis be great. But what happens when we live next door to Cousin Eddie and our neighbor is somebody we don't like, somebody we, would, we don't want to deal with? Here's the thing. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And in so doing, you will be transformed in some way into who he made you to be in Christ. And you will begin to love your neighbor as you do yourself because what does God do? He loves us. And when we love God and walk closely with him, he imparts to us by his Holy Spirit traits that only he can do, things that only he can do. And we begin to love people we once despised, not because we're good at it, but because we walk with God and we love him. We love him, and in so being in that relationship, we begin to love those he loves. Sword number five. 1 John 5.18. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps them safe, and the evil one can't touch them. Do I continue to sin, or do I repent? This is the sword that will probably cut deepest into most of us in this teaching. Do I continue in my sin, or do I repent? 
Remember, conviction says stop doing that. Make that right. The Spirit convicts us. We respond to be in relationship and not brokenness with God. Condemnation calls us worthless. It tells us we're of no value. It speaks lies into our life. Do I continue to sin or do I repent? Do I repent and turn away from sin and run towards Christ? Do I grab onto that which I love or do I justify where I'm at? Here's, here's what we need to know. To repent is not to be sorry. Being sorry means you probably got caught, right? That's when everybody's sorry. I'm not sorry I'm speeding until Johnny with lights on his car pulls me over. Then I'm very sorry, right? That's sorry. Repentance is feeling the twinge of the Spirit say, that breaks relationship and you stop it and you turn and walk away from it. Repentance is walking away from what breaks relationship with God. Repentance is turning away. So I want to talk about two kinds of sin tonight, and we're going to label them. One is a pest, and one is a pet, the pests. It is cold in Michigan now, right? Up here in Michigan, if you're looking, if you're watching this from somewhere else, we get this horrible thing that seems to last nine months. It's called winter, and it's starting right about now. Fall is beautiful. It's great. I love hunting season. I love the apples and everything. But we all know it's like ugly cousin is about to show up and smack us in the face with winter, right? It's cold. But what happens? All the mice who've been living out in the fields, they're happy. It's summer in Michigan. There's an abundance of food. But suddenly those fur-bearing varmints decide I'm a little cold on my tiny mice feet and I want in your house, right? And you may think, I'll just run into the house, grab something, and run back out. So you leave the front door open for like 30 seconds, and one of those little scurriers hustles in. You don't see it. And sin can be like that. It can be like a pest. It gets into your life through subtle little ways. And it creates a nest. And a mama mouse and a daddy mouse make nieces. And those make little dots in drawers. And you're like, oh, we have, a my, we have a mouse problem. Anybody ever get those? Nobody raised their hand because you're like, I don't want to be the gross person. We've gotten them before, right? You get mice once in a while, and what do you do? Sweet, we have mice. Let's put food out. No, you don't. You get snap traps. You lather them with peanut butter, and you set them down. You're like, ha, ha, ha. And then you watch TV on volume two because you're waiting for the, the whack, and you're like, yeah, got him. And you run in there, and sometimes there's just an arm, and you're like, oh, we got a three-legged mouse. And then it's kind of gross, and you re peanut butter it, and you put it down. And you go after the pest to eliminate it in your life because you don't want that polluting your house. It'll make a nest, it'll breed, and it'll get bigger. The problem will expand by other Mises. Then they have like cousins who they become a couple. It's weird. It's weird and it's wrong. And sin can be like that. It's like it just gets an infestation. And it sneaks in sometimes. And we have to deal with it. If there's little pesty sins in your life that reoccur, it almost feels like habitually. They get in a certain time of year and act a certain way. You need to get the snap trap out and you need to handle it and repent and walk away. Don't let the pest live in your house. But there's another kind of sin. And I always picture it like the guy who has like, you know, he somehow gets a tiger cub. And he lives in an apartment in Atlanta. He's like, this is awesome. It makes cool sounds. It's kind of fuzzy. It's like, and he's like, oh, I love it. And eventually, the cans of tuna aren't enough because squirt's growing now. And the next thing you know, he hasn't been seen for a few days. And there's a weird smell coming from Larry's apartment. And they open the door and go, there's a 400-pound tiger in there. Oh, my word. That dude got eaten by a, that is a tiger. And you call animal control, and they're like, what was that guy doing, doing having that pet in his house? I want to tell you, some of us have these little sins that are in our lives, and we think, no big deal. God disagrees. These little pets we keep that we think nothing sees and we feed it and we grow it and we allow it to become something that will devour our lives. It will devour our lives. There's this story of a lady who went, not a story, I actually read it, but um, she was online and she asked a question. My pet snake is behaving weirdly. I'm like, well, her pet human is weird. She has a snake. 
but that's a different topic. So I'm reading it, and it says this. It stretched out next to my daughter as she slept, and it slept lengthwise next to my daughter for like three nights. I'm like, here's a bag of not cool. Eat up, right? I don't like that. That's nasty. It's snakes. It's Satan's vehicle. I'm like, who has a snake? But the guy replies, get that snake in a cage and get it out of your house. Why? Boa constrictors, pythons, they like to measure what they're about to eat, and they use their body to do so. And she's like, how sweet. Toots is sleeping next to Barbara. And they think it's awesome until Barbara gets eaten, right? I'm serious. You may think I'm joking, but this happens. We keep pets in our lives in the form of sin that have no place in the life of a Christian. Let the word of God speak clearly. Repent. Repent and run from sin. Because you may think it's just a cute little thing now that I kind of do on the sly. Nobody knows it's going to eat you. It will become who you are. There is no way around it. The Apostle John has called us to let the word of God parse out in our lives whether or not we can be sure we are Christians. These swords that have cut in point us to know one thing. It points us to know who we are in Christ. Hear these words from 1 John 5, 13 to 15. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. So that you may know you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us and we know that if he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we will have that. Here's the thing. Don't let someone steal your joy of your salvation. Don't let someone say to you, if you're not keeping this ritual, if you're going to church on a Saturday, how dare you? Right? What about the Sabbath? I don't know. Most of you are going to sleep in tomorrow and have a Sabbath. Right? Those of you who are watching this on a Monday night, maybe you weren't there, you know, you weren't on Sunday. You're going to have a Sabbath. You get to have Sabbath. Don't let someone's rules steal your joy. Don't let people do to you what happened to me. If you don't speak in tongues, you're not a Christian. That was a lie that took a long time to get weeded out of my life. I wanted it. I prayed for it. I asked God to show me. Give me a prayer language. Here's the thing. Be comforted. Be comforted in who Jesus Christ is. And the work he's done that you could have never done. Be comforted and be hopeful knowing this. That your assurance of salvation rests in the hands of Jesus Christ. Not in the voice of the enemy who condemns you. It rests in the hands of Jesus Christ. And he has called you to himself to repent, confess, and be remade in his image. If you have confessed your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive He is faithful and just to forgive you and purify you from all unrighteousness. My friends, be comforted that this salvation is not complex. It's a come to me. Come to me, Jesus says. Come to me. In Jesus Christ, we find the hope that John is calling the church to. And the word of God points to over and over again. In Jesus Christ, we find salvation. And nothing in this world, in heaven above or earth below, can take away from you and I the eternal life secured for us in Christ Jesus. It is ours for eternity. Now we simply get to live in the joy and the abundance of that hope. Let the word of God speak clearly into your life tonight, today. Whenever you hear it, that your salvation is secure. Be comforted and walk closely with the one who called you his own. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you. Thank you for who you are and what you're doing. Bless this, your church, that we would turn our hearts towards you, that we would be soft and tender towards what you're doing, that we would keep no hidden sin in our lives, but rather we would stand close to you, living in deep relationship with you, walking with you in your word, and holding fast to the truth that we who have received Jesus Christ have a hope that can never be taken. Comfort those who fear for their, for their soul, but also, God, give them a confidence, we pray, to walk 
in relationship with you for the glory of Jesus Christ in this world and in the lives of those around them. We bless you, God, and give you praise. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. If you would like to prepare for next week's message, please click on the link below to get to our devotions. Now, devotions are an important part of the weekly rhythm at the Foundry Church. We hope that God spoke to you through this message, and we also hope that you join us again next week, because it's going to be great.